I wonder if I accidentally changed some settings so it started doing that out loud. Um, I had completely forgotten to post last week's lectures and you were both present for all of them so you probably didn't care much one way or another but I got those all posted today up through yesterday I think and um, so those are all up and I can't remember who it was emailed me yesterday about not being able to find any of those but they're up now anyway um did anyone have any questions on magnetism homework or questions or last year's test or anything like that good to go okay oh riley it might have been you that asked about the videos from last week. Uh, Riley, I got those posted this morning. So um, between now and this afternoon, you can catch up on those magnetism videos that were missing. And uh, I've got the test open, so it'll become available at 6.58 p.m. tonight. Um, I have to run into Spokane this afternoon, but I should be back by 7. But if I'm not, just go ahead and um, Join the Zoom meeting like you're supposed to. Have your camera aimed at yourself. And um, I'll log on as soon as I get back. And I should be back by 7, but um, don't know for sure yet. Uh, anyway, I could dive into our introduction to Einstein today. And uh, mostly this is biographical trying to correct a few misconceptions about him and uh, introduce some of his contributions. So we'll see about that and share screen here. Let's jump over to screen two and we'll be good to go. So Einstein, the man in the myth. This is what I called it the very first time I taught engineering physics back in spring of 1989, I think it was. So, all right, what am I looking for? There it is, the page I can click through. Um, also, it could be called Einstein Simplified because it's mostly non-mathematical. Sidney Harris is the cartoonist who did this and he's done a bunch of science cartoons. If we were in the classroom, you'd see a bunch of his cartoons on the wall. Um, here's one you see various takes on this thing. Uh, let's see. Then my favorite, I think, is this Far Side cartoon. I don't know if you've seen very many Far Side cartoons. Gary Larson is the person who did this, and he lived in Seattle. And I think he was a former mailman or something like that. And uh, he did this cartoon for about, I don't know, 15 or 20 years. And then he retired from cartooning to play jazz guitar. So not a bad life. OK, so some myths about Einstein. And these are things that uh, I used to query my students about to tell me things they'd heard about Einstein. And uh, after a while, I just stopped recording them because the same ones came up again and again. Every once in a while, there'd be a weird one that was based on some uh, movie that came out about Einstein or something like that. that usually a fictional movie, but uh, the first one, he was homeschooled. This is one that, um, oh, way back in the 1970s, I used to get some magazines that would occasionally have articles about homeschooling or else I'd see them in newspapers. And almost every time those articles would start off about homeschooling would start off with a list of famous people who had been homeschooled. And Einstein was always on the list. And uh, it's kind of a stretch to say he was homeschooled. He did do some of his own reading and studying, but um, he wasn't really homeschooled. 
Another one is he flunked math. These two might be contradictory. Usually people who are homeschooled don't flunk classes, so that could be a problem. Here's a quotation. We'll have a few from a biography of Einstein by Abraham Pays and maybe another biography too. Abraham Pays actually knew Einstein and uh, worked with him. Einstein was an old man well, Pays was, oh, I'm guessing in his 20s, maybe 30s at the time that he knew Einstein. But he had a thoroughly researched biography of him that at times is kind of hard to read because it goes into a lot of detail about his science. So, but um, in August 1886, which would have been when Einstein was about, um, seven years old, I think. Yeah. His mother wrote to his grandmother, yesterday Albert received his grades. He was again number one. His report card was brilliant. And then two years after that, he moved from the Volk School. I don't know how to pronounce these very well. Um, that Volk School would have been the equivalent of elementary school. And then the gymnasium gymnasium there's a little bit of a guttural sound to it but it would have been the equivalent of junior high and high school but in all those years he earned either the highest or the next highest marks in mathematics and in latin in those days in german schools they made a big deal of your ranking in the class and they would publicize it so it was no secret um, what happened in those schools so First of all, it's apparent that he went all the way through a German school system, although he did drop out shortly before he would have graduated. And we'll address that here in a little bit. Uh, but he was schooled in a regular school system, but he supplemented it, it himself with reading a lot of books about mathematics. And so, um, in a sense, he might have been homeschooled just because he had those interests, but uh, hard to say. He also did not flunk math, at least not at this level. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, other things, he was a poor student. Um, we'll address that a little bit when we look at his biography, but uh, see how he does. He was dyslexic. Okay, dyslexia is a learning disability where people sometimes uh, have a hard time uh, distinguishing letters sometimes, or they'll get things kind of mixed up and backwards and stuff like that. It's a learning disability that was first studied in about the 1960s. I don't think the term dyslexia even existed during Einstein's lifetime, and there was certainly no one studying it. And it's hard to diagnose someone with a learning disability when they've been dead for more than 10 years. And uh, he didn't really display any characteristics of it. He was a good learner. The, well, if you do a search, for Einstein and dyslexia. I did this in a couple of times. May 2018, 994,000 hits on Google. And some of them are really touching. There are pages that people have devoted to their dyslexic children. And on those, they'll say, I understand what Einstein's mother must have gone through. Well, she didn't have to go through anything. Her son was a good learner and uh, didn't have a learning disability. But it's a cognitive disorder of reading and speech. And here's where the idea of the dyslexia myth came from. And this was a, a biography by Ronald Clark that came out in 1971, not long after dyslexia was first named as a learning disability. So the bare facts of his early years are well enough known, but an aura of mythology surrounds most of the detail. 
and neither his sister nor either of his wives contributed significantly. Virtually, virtually all of it comes from Einstein himself in middle or old age. And the one feature of his childhood about which there appears no doubt is the lateness with which he learned to speak. His parents feared that he might be subnormal, and it has even been suggested that in his infancy, he may have suffered from a form of dyslexia. But who suggested it and who diagnosed it? And it would have been based on his recollections, not anybody else's. His sister was younger than he was. And so this one's really a stretch to, to try to claim that. And once he did start speaking, he did just fine. He learned mathematics. He learned to speak in three or four languages. He played the violin um, well enough to improvise and make money while he was in college as a violinist. So hard to say. Okay, he invented the atomic bomb. Actually, uh, there was some relation between Einstein and the atomic bomb, but by then he had immigrated to the U.S. when the U.S. Manhattan Project was going on, but he was prevented from contributing in any way because he was considered an enemy alien. So because he immigrated from Germany. Uh, and then the idea that only six people in the world understand relativity. It doesn't say which version of relativity. Uh, the special relativity that we'll look at. Um, at one time, there may have been six people in the world that understood it, but they might have been among the first 15 people to read the papers on it. So, and the other 15, if they read the papers again, they might have understood it then. So, uh, also a myth is that he won a Nobel Prize for relativity. So, let's actually look at his outline and see what we get. Born in Ulm, Germany, in 1879, this is horse and buggy days. Uh, Einstein never actually learned to drive, which wasn't unusual at that time, actually, um, people of his generation. This is right around the start of the, of when electricity starts being used. And uh, his father was a not so successful businessman who tried to make money selling dynamos, things that generated electricity or electric motors and things like that. So he had a bit of a background in there. 1880, the family moved to Munich. Uh, he started school at five or six, began playing the violin at six. And you often see pictures of him playing the violin, which he did throughout his life. Uh, when he, the last decade or 15 or 20 years of his life, he lived in uh, Princeton, New Jersey, and played in a group of musicians. They played string quartets a lot, and uh, so he continued playing that. 1888 began the German equivalent of middle school and high school. Um, here's one of the ideas that he may have been a poor student. Um, at the gymnasium, a teacher told him that he, the teacher, would not or would be much happier if the boy were not in his class. And Einstein replied, he'd done nothing wrong. And the teacher answered, yes, that is true. But you sit there in the back row and smile. And that violates the feeling of respect which a teacher needs from his class. Einstein did not like the German schooling system. It was based very strongly on memorization and just reciting facts. And uh, that wasn't his idea of learning. And I would guess that probably isn't the idea of learning for most of you either. You like learning how to do things. In 1895, the family moved to Italy, his father's factory in Germany had failed, and so they went to Italy to try again with a different factory in a different town. And they left him behind. And then not long after they left, Einstein went to a doctor, or Albert went to a doctor, I guess, and uh, 
had the doctor sign a note saying that he was unwell and would have to leave school. So he dropped out of school. This would have been sometime before March 14th, before his 16th birthday that he left. And uh, he showed up on his parents' doorstep in Italy. They did not know he was coming. So a pretty resourceful 15-year-old kid to get from Germany to Italy on his own. And uh, anyway, he joined his family, but he had dropped out of school before graduation. And that meant he didn't have a high school diploma. Um, that year, he applied to the ETH, which I can't pronounce anything correctly in, in Swiss and French, but it was the Swiss Polytechnic Institute. And uh, he, because he didn't have a diploma, he had to take an entrance exam. And he did well in mathematics and physics, but in some of the other areas, like I think modern languages and the arts, he didn't do well enough for entrance. And so uh, he went back to school that year and to a Swiss high school, which was much different from the German high school. He enjoyed it very much and uh, got his high school diploma and then got accepted the next year at the Swiss Polytechnic Institute. The ETH stands for, oh, I've got it here. Uh, if you know how to pronounce that, more power to you. Um, the S-C-H-U-L-E would be school. Um, I have no idea what this first thing means. Um, the second word is kind of polytechnic, but maybe the first word has something to do with being Swiss, I guess, but I don't know how that language works. 1900, he graduated. It is during these years, 1896 to 1900, that his reputation of being a poor student arose for a good reason, probably. Einstein wanted to study physics in college because he wanted to know about electricity and magnetism. When he was 15 years old, he said, I wonder how the world would look if you could ride on a beam of light. And he figured to know what it would look like, he'd have to learn about electricity and magnetism. So that's what he goes to college for. The lecturer in physics at the Swiss Polytechnic Institute thinks electricity and magnetism is not important, so he doesn't lecture on it. So Einstein stops going to class. He's got a roommate who takes good notes in class. Einstein will study his roommate's notes and do just fine on all the tests. But in those days, in college, they do something that they did when I was in junior high school and you'd get a grade for the academic part of the class and um, and then there'd be a column for conduct and a column for effort and they had something about like that in the college classes that Einstein took and he didn't do so well in the conduct and effort parts and um, so he didn't make a good impression on his teachers in, in college anyway. Uh, he graduates from college. He can't get a job. He did some substitute teaching for a while and finally got a job at a patent office. In those days, to get a job anywhere, you had to get good recommendation letters from your teachers. And not only did he not get good letters from them, they basically torpedoed his efforts. They'd write bad letters of recommendation. And so uh, he just couldn't get a decent job. A uh, woman that he'd met in college, um, Mileva Merrick, was a fellow physics student, and they had a daughter in 1902 who wasn't even known about until the 1990s, and the only reason that her existence came to light was because the love letters between Einstein and Mileva were finally released by Einstein's family after, let's see, almost 40 years after his death. And uh, some of the letters mention this girl whose name was Lysa or Lyserl. I'm not sure just how you pronounce it. Um, they weren't married yet. And so 
uh, they had to kind of hide her existence from his employers at the patent office. And so Maleva went home to her family's home in uh, Serbia. And the letters between the two are touching. In one last letter that Einstein wrote to her, they had been discussing possibly giving her up for adoption, uh, but she got sick. And the, the last letter that he wrote to her was, uh, you know, asking how she was and some other things. And then there's no further mention of her whatsoever. Um, we don't have whatever letter she wrote back to him after that one. And we don't have any, he never mentioned her in any of the letters he wrote again to her. So um, there was an epidemic of, uh, oh shoot, I can't remember what it is. Did anybody read the Little House on the Prairie books? <laughs> um, Scarlet fever, that's what it was, that was sweeping through Serbia at the time. And uh, it wasn't unusual for that, for children to die of scarlet fever, but uh, I don't know, or we don't know that she got it and died or if she was given up for adoption or what. No one has ever found any adoption papers for her. No one's ever found a death certificate for her or anything else. It's just a mystery. So 1903, he did marry Maleva Merrick and uh, in 1904, their first son was born. And then 1905 is Einstein's miracle year, is what it's considered. He'd written a few scientific papers before this. Um, I think his PhD thesis was one. Um, let's see, one of his early papers was on a a better method of determining Avogadro's number that just about doubled the precision from previous methods. So kind of an interesting thing. Um, but in his miracle year, he wrote some papers on special relativity. He wrote one on Brownian motion. Brownian motion is motion that was observed in the, oh, I think about the 1820s a botanist was looking through a microscope at pollen particles in a liquid and noticed this kind of jostling motion of the pollen particles. And the hypothesis always was that perhaps some small particles of the liquid were um, moving the pollen particles around when they collided with it. And Einstein's paper on Brownian motion goes through a careful statistical analysis of how those random collisions could cause that. And it's considered the first paper that put the atomic model of matter on firm theoretical footing. So it was a contribution in there. And it was one of Einstein's um, sort of sub areas that you don't hear a lot about, but he did a lot with statistical mechanics and uh, statistical thermodynamics as well. So, and he also wrote a paper on the photoelectric effect, which was the photoelectric effect was an effect that had been first observed by, I think Heinrich Hertz, if I remember right. And uh, he had uh, some electrons or electrodes that were in an evacuated chamber and uh, there was a power supply connected to the electrodes, but no current would flow in the circuit unless you shined light on the circuit. And there were some characteristics of how that light, uh, of the light that mattered. It had to be shorter than a particular wavelength or above a certain frequency before the, the current would flow in the circuit. And Einstein developed a hypothesis to explain that. And in that hypothesis, he pros, proposed that when light is emitted or absorbed, it's emitted or absorbed as a, a single bundle of energy. He called them light quanta. Nowadays, we call them photons. And uh, that's what he actually ended up getting the Nobel Prize for. Okay. He finally leaves the patent office four years after his miracle year and gets a job in academia. 
And let's see, he moved around a little bit for a while. I think, I can't remember if it was his first academic job or not. One of them was in uh, what was Czechoslovakia at the time. And then he had a job for a while at the college he'd gotten his bachelor's degree at, which was kind of inter ironic, I guess. Then in 1913, he was... Uh, hired at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute. Oh, by the way, he had renounced his German citizenship when he moved to Italy and when he started school in Switzerland. And I don't know if he actually became a Swiss citizen or not, but it was controversial to hire him back at this Kaiser Wilhelm Institute because he had renounced his German citizenship. One of the reasons he had done so was because in Germany, every child at the age of 16, every male child had to go and serve in the German military for some period of time. And Einstein had seen soldiers marching in a parade once as a child, and he didn't want to be like that. They looked like automatons, and uh, he just didn't like that idea at all. Plus, Jews were not treated well in the German military. And um, being Jewish, he wasn't so crazy about that. Okay, here's something from Max Planck's recommendation letter for Einstein. And this is 1913. It's eight years after his photoelectric hypothesis. And you can see here, all in all, one can say that among the great problems so abundant in modern physics, there's hardly one to which Einstein has not brought some outstanding contribution that he may sometimes have missed the target in his speculations, as, for example, in his theory of light quanta, the photoelectric effect, cannot really be held against him. For in the most exacting of natural sciences, every innovation entails risk. Okay, this was eight years after Einstein had written about his photoelectric hypothesis. Two years after that, an American experimentalist named Robert Millikan, who's famous for determining the charge on the electron, he was probably at the time one of the very best experimental scientists in the world. He did an experiment to try and disprove Einstein's hypothesis of the photoelectric effect and ends up confirming his hypothesis of the photoelectric effect. And then 10 years after that, about 10 years after that, um, in a, an observation called the Compton effect, Compton effect, uh, it's an experiment where a high energy X-ray photon comes in and knocks an electron loose from an atom. And in that effect, it shows that the momentum of the photon is conserved in the collision as if you were having a collision between a couple of pool balls. And that was considered the final confirmation that, yes, light behaves as particles if it carries momentum that's conserved in a collision like that. So anyway, uh, but by then Einstein had gotten the Nobel Prize for this. Um, 1916, he finishes general relativity. That's Einstein's theory of gravitation. We'll probably have a day where we look at just a little bit about general relativity, what it's about, what the predictions of it are, and things like that. But we're not going to go into the mathematics of that, which uh, requires, let's see, differential geometry, which is the calculus of curved space. And then a lot of the mathematics of it ex is expressed in tensor notation which is um, somewhat like vector notation, but it involves matrices instead of just, um, and multi-dimensional matrices instead of just uh, three-dimensional vectors. Okay, this is about 1916 when this picture was taken. And he actually, actually had a physical breakdown after he finished his papers on general relativity. He had been working absolutely like crazy on the things. And uh, it was hard on him. 
Okay, uh, 1919, one of the predictions of general relativity was that light would be bent by a strong gravitational field. And you can't usually see it, but during a total solar eclipse, the light from stars that are behind the sun can be bent by the sun's gravitational field. And so you can see those things. And stars that are near the sun in the sky at that time, their pos positions will shift slightly. And so there was a British expedition to the South Atlantic, um, one to Brazil and one to Africa to try and take pictures of the sky during the, the um, solar eclipse. And they confirmed that the light was bent by the amount that Einstein predicted. A year or two before that, there was another attempt to try and do this. There was a solar eclipse that was actually visible in Goldendale, Washington. There was another one visible in 1979 there, but in, I don't know if it was 1917 or 1918, but there was another one, but the, the observations were inconclusive for that one. And world fame followed. Um, here's a headline from the New York Times in 1919. Lights all askew in the heavens. And uh, after this, Einstein was heard of all over the world. So uh, in fact, he came to the United States not too long after this. This was, 1919 was the year after, in fact, this would have been almost exactly a year after the end of World War I, November 11th, 1918 was that. And it uh, immediately toward the end of World War I and following it, there was a worldwide pandemic, the Spanish flu, which actually first showed up in US military bases in the United States. So, um, an attempt to blame someone else for that one, but it actually, the Spanish influenza actually killed more people than died during World War I. And so there was this horrible war with a large number of deaths. And then immediately following it, you had the continuation of this pandemic that did that. People were looking for some sort of good news and this weird German with his idea that light travels on a curved path uh, was kind of good news. It was definitely a distraction from all the bad news that people had been experiencing. So 1922, he got his Nobel Prize for his services to theoretical physics and especially for his discovery of the law of the photoelectric effect. Um, the Nobel Prize Committee had assigned one of their members to read Einstein's scientific papers. Usually, um, a, when someone gets a Nobel Prize, it'll be somewhat specific as to what they got it for, in this case, the photoelectric effect. But in the case of Einstein's Nobel Prize, they specified that it was not for his special or general theory of relativity either one of which he could have gotten Nobel Prizes for, but the committee member who was assigned to read the papers couldn't understand those papers, especially the general relativity. General relativity is tough. Um, it's not, not for the faint of heart. You really do have to specialize in that area of physics to be able to make any sense of it. Okay, 1933, he left Germany for the last time. Actually, he was out of Germany on a, a trip when an, an election occurred in Germany, and that was when the Nazis were elected to power. And there was actually a price on his head for a time. And uh, he was provided with a bodyguard by the king of, oh, I can't remember if it was Belgium or the Netherlands now, but um, one of those two countries uh, was a personal friend of his and provided him with a bodyguard, but he ended up immigrating to the, to the United States in 1933 and did not go back to Germany. 
1939, he wrote a letter to Roosevelt, and I don't know, usually if it was in class, I'd, I'd give you a photocopy of this letter, and I don't know if I've got it in this PowerPoint or not. But it was a letter that Einstein didn't actually write. It was actually written by, oh, either a Bulgarian or a Hungarian physicist. But they took it to Einstein and um, he made some edits to it and then signed it as if he had written it. And it encouraged or warned Roosevelt about the fact that it might be possible to develop bombs that took advantage of the E equals MC squared part of uh, special relativity. And people had been studying the radioactive decay of uranium and he thought it or mentioned in the letter that it might have been possible to develop bombs that could be very powerful that could completely destroy a city with a single bomb and things like this. And uh, the letter was fairly prescient. Einstein didn't really write it so much, but uh, he agreed with it. And so he wrote that off. That's the only thing he ever had to do with the U.S. atomic bomb effort. He uh, wasn't actually allowed to work on it. So, and it's not even known if that letter had any effect on the, the effort or not. Um, we just don't know if Roosevelt ever even saw it or if it got to one of his assistants and they brought it to his attention or not. We just don't know. 1940, he became a U.S. citizen and here he is at his swearing-in ceremony. I could not find, there's a picture of him sitting in the chair at the, at the ceremony and he's all dressed up there in his tie. It looks like he might have made some effort to comb his hair that day. And, uh, but he's got his dress shoes on but no socks. And at some point before this, probably sometime in the 1930s, he just decided socks were a waste of time. So he stopped wearing them even when he was dressed up in his suit like that. Okay, 1955, he died of an aortal aneurysm, which is a, a burst artery for the heart. And um, Nowadays, it's something that could have been uh, treated with surgery before it became that dangerous. But this was, oh, roughly 10 years before the first open heart surgeries were done, working on things like that. So um, he missed his chance. But he was 76 by then. And then here's a headline from the New York Times. February 11th, 2016, a team of scientists announced on Thursday that they had heard and recorded the sound of two black holes colliding a billion light years away, a fleeting chirp that fulfilled the last prediction of Einstein's general theory of relativity. For a long time, his general theory of relativity was kind of ignored. Um, even up until, oh, sometime in the 1960s, he came out with it in 1916, and there were a few predictions that were looked at in intervening years, but uh, there wasn't any way to, to test them. The predictions that general relativity made, other than the light bending thing and a few other ones, were so subtle that they were not detectable in the electronics that existed up until about the 1960s. And then the the electronics revolution came along, taking advantage of the development of the transistor and all the things that could be built after that. And then people started investigating some of the other ideas of Einstein's theory. And with the gravity waves, that took so much more than just electronics. Um, I wish we could have gone down there on a field trip this year, but uh, it's measuring stuff extremely difficult to measure, but uh, that's the last confirmation. And so prove Einstein was right, or at least they verify his theory. So um, they haven't disproven it yet. People are still trying to, um, to find 
variations or disagreement between observation and Einstein's general theory of relativity, but uh, haven't been successful in doing that yet. And uh, the reason that they're looking for those disagreements is because it's expected that at some point the correct theory of gravitation will be a quantum theory, sort of like there is for light, that uh, light is carried by something that has both a wave-like and a particle-like nature. And the expectation is that gravity will be also, but it's going to be something more difficult to measure than detecting gravitational waves. So it may be a while, maybe a few generations before anything like that happens. So that was the little biography of Einstein. Um, now I'd like to briefly just look at a little bit of special relativity here. If this one will open. Okay, the young Einstein here. This is the, the 1905 Einstein at his desk in the Swiss Patent Office. And Einstein's special relativity is based on a couple of postulates, and we'll talk about why this is the case. A postulate is an assumption or axiom, a prerequisite or a basic principle. And special relativity starts with this. The laws of physics must be the same in all inertial reference frames. An inertial reference frame is one that is non-accelerated. So it's moving with constant velocity with respect to any other reference frame. Once you start accelerating, then stuff gets complicated. You may have to make up fictitious forces like centrifugal force or the Coriolis force. Those are things that show up in rotating reference frames, which are accelerating. So that was the first assumption. Now, um, we call this the Galilean principle because Galileo had actually proposed this way back in the 1600s. He proposed thought experiments, which people hadn't really done before, but he had in his thought experiments, he said things like, suppose that you were on a ship down in the hold of the ship, so you couldn't look outside. And the ship that you were in was either at rest or it was moving through still water at a constant speed. And you could do experiments there and you wouldn't be able to tell if you were moving or not. And the experiments he had in mind were, suppose you had a cage full of butterflies. <laughs> That's a different sort of experiment, but suppose that was the case. Those butterflies would just kind of flutter around in the cage, spreading themselves out. And you couldn't tell from that whether they were moving with a moving ship or whether the ship was at rest. You could also do something like you imagine having a wine skin and you have the stopper a little bit loose so that wine would drip slowly out of the wine skin. And if the ship was at rest, that wine would appear to drip straight down. If it was moving with constant velocity, it would appear to be moving straight down as well. And so that's why we call this the Galilean principle of relativity. Now, when Galileo pros, proposed it, pretty much the only laws of physics were what he thought of as his laws of motion, like what became Newton's first law of motion. But that name stuck. And so after Newton developed the law of gravitation and his laws of motion, the Galilean principle would still work with those things. And it worked that way up until about the mid 1800s when James Maxwell writes down his laws of electricity and magnetism. And here's what they are. The laws of physics for Einstein would have meant all those laws like this integral of E dot DL and B dot DL. Um, these are the two different versions of Faraday's law, one for a changing electric field, one for a changing magnetic field or magnetic flux. And so now those laws would include that. But 
when you include Maxwell's equations, built into Maxwell's equations is a wave equation for the speed of light. You just have to take a derivative of uh, two of the equations and you can combine them together and you have the wave equa equation for electromagnetic waves. And built into that wave equation is the speed of light. And so when Einstein says the laws of physics must be the same in all inertial reference frames, something else happens as a consequence of that. And that is the speed of light in vacuum has the same value in all inertial frames, regardless of the velocity of the observer or of the source or the velocity of the source emitting the light. Okay. This is getting kind of complicated. So I'll escape from here and call up my IPVO, which I thought I turned on. Yeah, we have just a, a minute to consider the consequences of this for a few minutes. Hopefully you can see that thing. I'll blow it up when I don't know why but I can't make the margin go away. Log into YouTube first. I don't want to do that. Huh. Yep. This doesn't like me anymore. Unless... Nope. That doesn't do it. Oh well. I don't need that much paper. Here's the idea with that light traveling at the same speed regardless of motion of the source or observer. And we'll look at consequences of that. And uh, this will be a, a pretty weird thought experiment. We'll start off with two rocket ships out in space. And there's the nozzle that they can fire the rocket engine out of. And on top of each rocket ship, we'll put an astronaut. And the astronaut is holding this Acme light gizmo. This would be like something Wiley e. Coyote would do if you even know who I'm talking about, but never mind. At any rate, it's a special flashlight and the flashlight can send light out, but it will also measure the speed at which the light leaves the flashlight. And if any light comes into the flashlight, it'll measure the speed of that as well. And so we've got another rocket ship over here and on that rocket ship, there's a guy who's got one of those super duper flashlights himself. And so these two can aim beams of light at each other. And say this guy sends a beam of light out of the flashlight and it comes up over to this one. Well, this person can measure the speed of light as it's leaving his flashlight and he'll say, it will travel at the speed of light as it's moving away from me. This person over here can measure the speed at which the light comes into the flashlight and will say the light is arriving at the speed of light. Well, that's no surprise if the rocket ships aren't moving. Okay. However, what if they are moving? So now we can make, I'll probably stop drawing the uh, astronauts on top just assume that they're there and they've got their super duper flashlights. So now we'll have this rocket firing its rocket engine and imagine that it's moving in this direction at 0 0.5 C, where C is the speed of light. And then we can just imagine that this rocket over here is at rest, or at least they're not firing their rocket engine. And so they're at rest. Well, the astronaut on this sending out the beam of light will say the light is leaving my flashlight at the speed of light. Okay. But the rocket is supposedly moving through space at half the speed of light. Maybe there's some moon that's sitting here that they agree that's going to be our reference point and we'll measure our speeds with respect to that moon. So they can say I'm going at half the speed of light with respect to that moon. This person would say, I'm at rest with respect to that moon. But this person would say the light leaves the flashlight at the speed of light. 
the person on this rocket will say the light is reaching my detector at the speed of light, according to Einstein. You could have both of them moving toward each other and we can bump up the speed a notch. So this time I'll maybe draw the astronauts with their super duper flashlights. And let's see, get the nozzle on the back. We can have both of them firing their rockets. Maybe this one's going in that direction at 0.7 times the speed of light. And this one is going at this direction now at 0.8 times the speed of light. And the person standing on this flashlight, when they turn on the flashlight, and the beam goes out from there, they'll still say that light is leaving my flashlight at the speed of light. This person could turn on their flashlight and they'll say the light is leaving my flashlight at the speed of light. When they receive the light from the other flashlight, they'll say the light is entering my flashlight at the speed of light. So no matter what they do, the light is always traveling at the speed of light with respect to them. Now, if that's going to be the case, something's going to have to give. Because if you thought of this as just a relative motion problem, this person's going at 0.8 times the speed of light, and the light is moving away from them at the speed of light, it should be going at something like 1.8 times the speed of light with respect to that moon. And then this person's headed that direction at 0.7 times the speed of light. You'd add that to the 1.8 times the speed of light. And you'd think they'd say, oh, the light's coming at me at two and a half times the speed of light. But that's not what Einstein says. And if that's the case, something's going to have to give. And tomorrow we'll look at what one of the things that gives. And it turns out to be the way they measure time. And after that, one of the other things that gives is the way that they measure space. So we'll have disagreements going on this. And um, tomorrow we'll actually look at some of the mathematics of that. But it's kind of fun stuff, but it's all based on the laws of physics are the same in all inertial reference frames. Okay, so that's where it starts from. Okay, um, does anyone have any questions they'd like answered about stuff that might be on the test this afternoon or any problems you looked at that you might be interested in seeing solutions to? Confident? Okay, the videos are all up on, um, on magnetism now. I got those posted this morning. And uh, let's see, everything's published. The test is published. You won't have access to it until 6.58 p.m. tonight. And uh, I'll give you two hours to take the test in, try to budget your time there. And then I've got some extra time at the end of it so you can uh, get it turned into a PDF and mailed in. Or, yeah, actually, there's a place on the assignment to post it there. And it's only going to take a PDF this time. So, well, actually, I think that's been the case for all our tests. Um, it's my other classes that I've been getting other forms of tests from. So, but at any rate, 7 o'clock tonight, and I'll see you then.